Hello, um, this is a part uh, of a series of interviews with people who are helping to build a new kind of economy. One that's democratic, sustainable and non-extractive, which the current economy certainly isn't. Uh, by extractive, we mean the flow of wealth from communities and ordinary working people to tax havens, ultimately. We'd like to put a stop to that. Um, today, I'm talking with Matthew Slater. He's the author of the Credit Commons White Paper. Uh, an idea to link together mutual credit schemes anywhere in the world to create a global moneyless trading system. Hello, Matthew. Good day. Um, your white paper changed my life. And now I'm part of a team working on the Open Credit Network, a mutual credit network for the UK. Um, but before we start talking about potential solutions to the world's problems, is it too late? I, I know you've been working with Jim Bendel on his deep adaptation program. Is it already too late to turn things around or are we looking at some sort of societal collapse? And are you thinking that the best we can do is to push back the date of that collapse? Well, the, the idea of societal collapse, a lot of people seem to have in mind is very undefined. Um, what I very strongly believe is that it's too late to avert catastrophic climate change. And so we're heading very rapidly towards two degrees, three degrees, four degrees of global warming and destruction of many, if not most of the global ecosystems on which we depend for our food and for pretty much everything. So I think that uh, regardless of anything that you or I are likely to be able to do in the next five years, um, we're going to see a wholesale destruction of our way of life. And so we need to be thinking in terms of uh, resilience and adaptation to climate change. I would argue more than mitigation of climate change. And the mainstream debate is still about mitigation. It's still how can we keep under two degrees or under 1.5 degrees while the science is saying, no, the ocean is already warm enough to keep the air warming for the next 40 years, there's no chance of staying under those thresholds. And so we know that difficult times are coming. We don't know exactly what kind of difficult times. Um, and so we need to be thinking in general terms about how to build more resilient lives and maybe more specifically more resilient communities. And so you think mutual credit is a way of building resilience in the communities? I do think that uh, mutual credit is a way of decentralizing uh, our economy, which is one of the principles of uh, resilience. Uh, and I think that uh, also with a decentralized economy, you, you would also have uh, decentralized production and uh, smaller supply chains because uh, the money the way that money works influences all of those mechanisms. I guess we have to explain briefly what mutual credit is for people who don't know. Um, but first, just tell me a bit more about why you are doing this. Why is moneyless trade such a good idea? Uh, there are many, many criticisms of the fiat money system. The one that uh, I dwell on at the moment is that uh, money now is created when people borrow it into circulation. So you go to the bank, you take out a mortgage. That money didn't exist before. Uh, you spend it into the economy and then uh, it, it leaves the economy. Usually at the end of the supply chain, it ends up in, uh, in somebody's tax haven bank account. And that means that uh, the money isn't available for the borrower to earn back and to pay back their debt. And so you have this uh, disequilibrium where more and more money is being called into existence because it's needed, and then it's being saved and locked away so that it can't be paid back. And that creates a lot of problems of uh, inequality and uh, economic injustice because people are borrowing money and they're not able to earn it to pay it back. And, and how did you get into all this? Was there a light bulb moment? It was when I decided I could find a little niche for myself, programming 
software for local exchange trading systems. And someone told me that the financial crisis that had just happened then in 2008 was done on purpose. And I couldn't imagine how uh, anyone could do something like that on purpose, both uh, morally, ethically, uh, but also how would you uh, actually control the financial system like that? So I started getting into uh, alternative media and learning economics from that. Um, and that showed me that there's very little understanding of what money is and how it works in the mainstream. And there are some very valid criticisms of money and alternative views of money, uh, which have been pushed to the margins of the economic discourse. Do you want to have a, a quick go at explaining mutual credit very briefly, because we can we can link to other sources of information. But for people who don't know, what's mutual credit? Well, let's. Uh, I've already given you a, a description of the fiat money, where it's borrowed from the bank, and then it kind of circulates forever uh, or gets locked away, um, and so it's not available to be repaid. With mutual credit money. Um, it's very difficult to save because it doesn't pay any interest and you can't uh, make it scarce and charge interest on it. And so you may as well spend it back into circulation and make it available for the people who borrowed it into existence to pay back their loans. Um, the ledger shows that for every debt, there is a credit. So it all exists in one system and you can prove that the books balance and this means that uh, from a, uh, an economic uh, moral perspective, mutual credit is the accounting of exchange. So for everything you spend, you must earn it back. And for everything you earn, you must spend it back. So you begin on zero, you end on zero. The sum of all accounts at any one time is zero. And the, the ledger is just showing you the imbalance, the current imbalance in your exchange. Does that make sense? So if it's your intention to exchange, you might use mutual credit accounting. If it's your intention to accumulate, you probably want fiat money or commodity money of some kind. So I, I think, um, I mean, the, the, I think the penny really dropped for me about mutual credit when I read Tom Greco's book, The End of Money, yeah. The Future of Civilization. And then uh, not long after, I read your Credit Commons white paper. And uh, I'm not saying I understood all the technical details, but I did understand the implications of it, if it worked. And um, I interviewed Tom. Um, and so I'll put a link to Tom's interview in the, uh, in the description below. And I'll put a link to more information about mutual credit, more basic introductory inform information about mutual credit, and to your white paper and to the MOOC, the, uh, the massive online open course about, about the money system, about uh, the history of money, the problems it causes, and the alternatives. Uh, which, and I did, your, I did that MOOC, and it was very interesting, and I'll put a link to that in the description as well. Um, so there are people who would point to cryptocurrencies as a more viable solution. Uh, why is mutual credit a better idea? Well, cryptocurrencies have, um, uh, they're much closer to fiat money than to mutual credit. Um, cryptocurrency is about building a world without trust. So you don't trust the government, you don't trust the banks, and that means uh, nobody has the authority to guarantee the value of each token. So the only way that cryptocurrency tokens are valuable is because there's a market for them and there might be a demand for them. Um, so it's not a very useful form of money because the value is always fluctuating. Um, it might be nice if you've got uh, no monetary policy and no one in charge of the quantity of money. Um, that might reassure some people, but at the same time, monetary policy is also there for a reason. Uh, you want to have the right quantity of money that the economy needs to facilitate trade. And in a system like Bitcoin, you've got a more or less fixed quantity of money. And um, there's no notion that uh, there's a specific, specific economy that uses it. 
if uh, more and more people want to use Bitcoin, the value will go up, which means it's really great if you already own Bitcoin, um, uh, you benefit from the speculation, but it's not great if you're you know, planning future purchases and the price of your money goes up, or if you happen to owe Bitcoin and the price of the money goes up. So um, fiat money works very much in that way as well. When it's traded on international markets, the prices go up and down relative to each other, creating what's called exchange risk. In mutual credit, uh, the community decides the purchasing power of the coin and then they just stick to it. And there isn't a market for the, uh, the units because you can just create them and destroy them as needed. Uh, it's a unit of debt. It's created when you borrow it. It's, uh, it's destroyed when you pay it back. Yeah. And what about um, Facebook's proposed Libra coin? Lots of people have uh, got high hopes about that. I'm not sure what exactly they're hoping for. This is Facebook's attempt to take over the world by creating another Silicon Valley monopoly. They've got all the credit card companies on board. Um, they're hoping to make a currency that's more stable than the US dollar, maybe ultimately more liquid than the US dollar. And this is why uh, the French Minister of Finance has, uh, has said that it poses a risk to sovereign current currencies. They want the Facebook coin to be used all over the world. They're pushing it especially towards developing countries and those people they call the unbanked people. Uh, people that the banks haven't worked out how to make a profit from. Uh, Facebook believes it's worked out a way to make a profit from them because those people have phones um, and they can do transactions using cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, it may provide a measure of convenience for payments, for online payments, um, but we have to be careful all the time just whose money is it we're using. If I'm holding $1,000 of Facebook coins, that means I'm actually financing Facebook to the tune of $1,000. I'm actually lending them that much money and they're giving me a token in return. Do you think Facebook are in a race with WeChat, the, the Chinese company for... Um, somebody I'm not aware that WeChat is attempting to uh, break out of China. Um, but I think Facebook is trying to do what WeChat is doing, which is basically to own all social networks and everything we do with each other. Somebody, uh, which, somebody said the other day that uh, Mark Zuckerberg wants to be a panopticon, wants Facebook to be a panopticon, which I thought was well, a fantastic word. <laughs> uh, it already is a panopticon, yeah. uh, except for the fact that it's not quite a prison. Well, if you try to get out of Facebook, you find it is a bit like a prison because uh, it's difficult to delete your data and uh, there isn't really anywhere else to go in terms of social networking. Uh, the whole idea behind the social network is that everybody is there uh, and everybody is on Facebook. So if you want to make another social network, you, it's a very difficult task because you have to drag everybody there, meaning you have to persuade all your friends to install some new software or create a new account somewhere, not to mention learning a new user interface. This is a whole other conversation, which I'm sure we'll have at some point. But um, back, to the, back to the currency. What about those who say we should go back to the gold standard? Um, the gold standard... Uh, it's good for some things and not for others. The historians disagree. Uh, they're, they're split straight down the middle on ideological lines. So the gold standard was very good in the way that it required all countries to develop equally because they had to balance their trade. Same in the credit commons, you have to balance your trade. Um, but there was a problem with the gold standard because as the economy grew, um, as more and more countries subscribed to the gold standard, there wasn't really enough gold to go around. And so uh, it very quickly became a fractional reserve system where there was more promises of gold than actual gold. And uh, in both cases, if you count the British gold standard and the Bretton Woods gold standard, they both collapsed for the same reason, that there wasn't enough gold 
to pay off all the promises of gold. Mm. So uh, you can't make new gold. Uh, in a gold standard, the quantity of money is fixed. And so your monetary poli policy options are limited to how many times you leverage the gold you have. And that runs the risk that one day somebody will come and they'll say, can I have my gold, please? And you won't have any gold to give them. So would you, would you like to explain the credit commons? And I'll ask questions as you go along, especially if you get too technical. I, I want as many people as possible to understand them. So, so Tom Greco said, what the world needs now is a means of payment that is locally controlled, globally useful. So if we have local mutual credit schemes all over the world, how can they be linked together to create a global trading system? Well, Tom Greco's statement is a good starting point because it says what's needed. So the Credit Commons is locally controlled in that anybody can get together with their friends or trading partners and create a group. And in that group, they say, it's a mutual credit group, so they say we will trust each other to pay back uh, the credit that we give to each other. Um, so that enables them to trade amongst themselves without money. That's not, however, globally useful. The credit that those people are giving to each other is only acceptable by themselves. So if you want to make the credit acceptable more widely, what that group has to do is join with other groups. And then each of the groups, they do the same thing. They say to each other, we will value your credit, meaning we trust you to make good on your promises. So we'll give you goods knowing that you'll give us goods in return. So now we've got a group of groups. Well, it's still not globally useful, but you can use the same mechanism to create a, a nested system that covers the whole world. So you could have a top level group with all the continents in and then uh, countries in the continents and then regions in the countries. Uh, and you could bring it right down to a uh, street by street basis. So everybody's issuing credit, but the, the credit, because it's guaranteed by the group and the group of the group is good to go across the world. So um, what obstacles do you face and, and how, how can we remove them? Well, if the Credit Commons was a plan for global domination, it would face many obstacles. Um, economists don't think in this way at all. Um, so there'll be no support from the economist profession. Uh, that means that the banks and the governments won't hear about it. Uh, it would have to be built from the grassroots up. Um, then there's a technical obstacle. At the moment, we've got no business model. Uh, if, if you think of the Credit Commons as just a mere accounting engine, uh, we would have to build it, but also tell investors that it would make money. Um, and the way I think about the Credit Commons, it's just a private ledger. It doesn't really want to make money. It wants to provide a service. It wants to be a piece of infrastructure in the same way that uh, roads aren't supposed to make money. They, they had to um, sell them to private companies and put toll booths on them in order for roads to make money, but it's still not very efficient. And that way it locks out a lot of the potential users who just go on the slower roads and use more petrol. Um, so the Credit Commons, I think of that as infrastructure and it's very difficult to fund infrastructure in today's um, uh, in today's environment where everything has to get a return and preferably make a profit. So that's another obstacle. Another obstacle is that communities in the sense of people who really trust each other to do things reciprocally in the future, they don't really exist in any formal way. So if you wanted to make a credit commons group, you'd have to get together with your friends and say, we are a group and sort of constitute yourself. Maybe not uh, as a legal association, but at least enough to own a software instance on a web server. And so people don't think of themselves in those small units anymore. People are much more likely to identify with their employer or their football team or things like that. 
But you could have a, you could have a, a local mutual credit uh, credit commons ready group at, at your town level, couldn't you? You, you could to attract more people in at the town level. So if you want to start at the town level, you might talk to the Chamber of Commerce or the City Council or something like that. And you would probably bring in a lot of the businesses and sole traders. And you'd say to them, well, uh, look, as long as you guys promise to pay each other back, uh, you can all have a, 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 a line of credit with each other and that will save you using some money. So, so I guess we're looking for local conveners, aren't we, to start these local groups? And I mean, soon the, the Open Credit Network, we will have a package um, which will include a website, a directory, a transaction engine for these local, these local conveners. So I suppose the message is if you, if, you want to, if you want to start a local group in your town, then let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll talk. So the Open Credit Network is building a template yeah 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 um so so something about so, so a penny dropped for me when i realized that because credits always have to equal debits you can't get credit unless somebody else has gone into exactly the same amount of debit in the same yeah. in the same way as if i gave you a fiver for something i'm a fiver down and you're exactly a fiver up because we, we don't yeah. have change you haven't made any money just no. by lending me a fiver. Exactly. Or buying something from you for a fiver. It's, it's, mm -hmm. And there's them. Um, so because the credits always equal debits, even if it covered the entire world, there's no value inherent in the system itself. And so no value can be extracted and concentrated and used to corrupt the political system or put into tax havens. And it's the only exchange system that doesn't contain any inherent inherent value, isn't it? Well, it depends what you think uh, value is or even inherent value. But the way I think of it is uh, when you look at uh, a pound coin, you think it has value, but you forget that somebody else is in debt to the tune of a pound. In mutual credit, because the pound of credit and the pound of debt are on the same ledger, it's harder to forget that they are intimately connected. It's like you think matter exists, but you forget that there's an equal and opposite amount of antimatter in the universe. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, what's your vision? I mean, are you, you mentioned quite a lot of obstacles. Um, can they be overcome? How big can this get? Or is it, is it going to work? It's I don't know if it's going to work, but it's something I want to do. Um, I'm not attached to the outcome anymore because there isn't really very long to do anything yeah. um, before we're going to be making emergency measures and reconstructing our society around whatever climate change is going to do for us. Yeah. So I'm, um, I'm supporting the credit commons and the building of local mutual credit networks because it seems like the right thing to do and a useful thing. Uh, and also because it's a way of building community and community is what we're going to need to get through climate change. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, will the will the powers that be, the elites of this world, do you think they'll fight back if they can see their their potential for profit undermined? I'm sure they will. Um, th there are ways uh, that you can issue credit to one another informally. Um, that could be outlawed. But to me, it seems. There's something very wrong about a government that says, because you did this, because you created this that was valuable, you have to give us some. That's a different message to, because you used our money, you have to give us some. Um, so I, I'd like to draw a, a, a line there and say, no, the government has no jurisdiction over my private relations in my private circle with my friends who I trust. They I might, want to make that closed. They might see it differently, though. They might see it differently, but then they might have bigger fish to fry. They might. Until, well, until, well, we'll see, we'll see. But if, if the value of the credit units in a, in a local scheme are related to the value of the national currency, what happens if there's a massive inflation in a particular country or economic collapse and, and their currency is worthless? How do we get the credit units away from national currencies altogether? Well, the, the value of a unit in a mutual credit system is just declared by the members. 
So if using the national unit no longer works for you, then you can just make the value something else. Um, on, it worked in Brazil, I think. They had a currency uh, called the real, which was the value of one egg. And they did that in order to stop hyperinflation. They said, we'll price everything in eggs. And then eventually the price in eggs was stable. So they just started issuing a new currency in eggs or real. Yeah. So uh, a local group could do that very, very easily. And, and would the Credit Commons be able to include all existing let systems and time banks and commercial barter schemes? Uh, would they need to change anything? Would they need special software? And would they actually do it, do you think? Um, in order to trade with people using the Credit Commons protocol, all you have to do is negotiate with them an exchange rate between your currency and theirs and balance limits, meaning how much credit you give each other. Um, so it doesn't matter to the protocol if one group is trading in time and another group is trading in eggs, um, as long as they can make an exchange rate. The, the obstacle is more likely to be technical. There's the whole business barter uh, sector at the moment, they're all using different kinds of software and they don't see interoperability as benefiting their business model. Um, that's why the Open Credit Network feels that it has to start again from scratch in building these local groups mm -hmm. because the business barter community uh, is very hard to engage with. I guess it's difficult to build the infrastructure of the Credit Commons, but it's it's a complicated problem rather than a complex problem. So it could be solved with enough computing power and the right skills and enough resources. So yeah. well, I was working uh, with Dill Green on it recently. We were specifying the software and yeah, it all looks completely manageable. It's not uh, devastatingly complicated. Um, the idea is to build, uh, uh, having defined the protocol to build a unit of software that implements the protocol and then you can just plug them all into each other to build this nested hierarchy. I guess the, the more complex problem is, um, you know, for, for, for which there's no clear solution and no amount of technology or money or skills can guarantee you'll get it right, um, is how to bring people in, how to, how to get people to actually use it. Uh, how, how do you think we should approach that, do you think? Well, there are lots of possibilities. Um, as you know, I favor the climate change message, um, but there's also the, the message that this builds community and it builds trust, uh, perhaps with a view to coming climate change. Uh, then there's the pitch that the business barter industry itself uses, which is that this is a, a free line of credit and a way to um, move your surplus capacity. So they say, well, if you've got a restaurant and you have empty tables on a Monday night, you might as well sell those empty tables for uh, mutual credit. Uh, then at least you can get something for them. Mm -hmm. um, but you could imagine other approaches. You could talk about the monetary reform approach and say, this is grassroots monetary reform. That doesn't engage a lot of people. Mm. Um, oh, I think the community and trust approach mm -hmm. is, is the best approach actually. I, um, I find myself, when I'm, when I'm talking to uh, maybe conveners of local small business networks and I start, start talking about interest-free credit and, and this kind of thing, I can, I can hear myself talking and I'm thinking, this sounds like a bit of a scam. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound real. Whereas if you start talking about how to bring your community to get together and, and, and build trust in your community, it's a, it's a much better start, I think. And if you, if you get across that you're actually setting up a cooperative and not-for-profit not for group with, with using free software that anybody can use that package. People start to realize that actually you're doing it for the right reasons. You're not, you're not looking to make money out of them. You're, you're, you're doing it because it's, it's the right thing to do. And um, for me, it's also about economic justice and even a more efficient and prosperous economy uh, because you don't have this problem of ever accumulating debt. Um, for, you know, if somebody is in debt, then you're guaranteed that uh, the money will be available to earn it back. 
and uh, also the problem of inequality is much less in the credit commons because you don't have the ability to save up the money and keep it away from people and then lend it to them at interest mm. so justice is critical at least for me mm -hmm. and when i cause i'm from a i'm from a working class background and when i go back to see my family um and old friends where i grew up you can't really reach people with um, environmental arguments or even arguments about democracy or the banks or it's like they're, you know, they're too busy just sort of getting by and they're not interested. But when, as soon as you start to talk about local uh, communities and, and building trust in communities, that they're, they're very interested in that, I found. I, I found because uh, community has been really destroyed in lots of working class towns around the country, I think. They've built a dual carriageway right through my, my old town, and they, you know, the big, big Tesco's just destroyed the high street, and and and, you know, it's not it's not it's not very pleasant, and a lot of people have big dogs to to protect themselves from basically other people in their community, and and any talk about making it making the communities friendlier, and more interesting, and safer, people really want that, I think, and I I, I think everybody everywhere gets that, and it's certainly. How do they react when the government and the local government talk about things like community policing and uh, making community centres? Uh, is that the same kind of community that the, the people uh, are hungry for? This is, this is real sort of nuts and bolts. It's, it's building a new uh, local economy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's bringing economic actors together because I think, I think that the stuff has been locked, knocked out of communities so much in most towns that it's a real struggle to get people to come together in working in working class areas, and people tend to sort of stay in and watch the telly and or, or go to their local pub if it's a reasonable pub. And often they're not. Uh, but but everybody I've talked I've talked to about your credit and um, also they don't want any nonsense. They don't want any sort of convoluted philosophy. They just want how does it work? Give me the nuts and bolts. You know, if you're a plumber or a builder, you're you're used to sort of nuts and bolts answers. And say, okay, it works like this. You get an account. You, you, if you want to buy something, uh, the person you buy from gets credit, and you get exactly the same amount of debit. There's a limit to how far you can go into credit and debit. Uh, and that's basically, if you, you're right, so you don't need any money. So it works. If your community has no money, then it still works. People are very interested in it. Um, yeah, so. Um, just to finish off, are we doomed? Well, it depends what you mean by doomed. Some people think that uh, human species is likely to go extinct, possibly very soon. What do you um, certainly with uh, four to five degrees of warming of the world in 80 years will be unrecognizable uh, in terms of the ecosystems, the climate and the landscapes. Humans can probably work out how to live or build ecosystems or domes. There's that film Logan's Run where everybody lives in domes uh, that are hermetically sealed from the outside world. Yeah. I mean, it's not, um, it's not you know, we may get through, but I, I think there is going to be uh, an awful lot of death and despair and destruction and poverty. I think that uh, governments like the UK um, are likely to institute some kind of food rationing system before very long. Um, uh, but they'll also be looking at uh, capitalism and the market to solve the problem of food shortages. And that means the problem of allocating the food to poor people who don't deserve it. So um, a soft government uh, could certainly make the situation easier for a lot of people. I guess there already is a lot of death and despair and poverty in, in lots of parts of the world. It's just, I guess it's coming closer to home, isn't it? Yeah. And it's not just climate change, is it? I mean, the, there's massive biodiversity loss. Uh, especially insects at the bottom of the food chain and pollinators and the soil builders. And that's, uh, it's partly climate change, and it's also 
removal of habitat and pesticide use as well, isn't it? Well, there's a lot we could do to uh, slow the advance of our ecosystem destruction, um, but it's just not happening at the government level. Mm. Uh, we heard towards the end of last year that we've got 12 and a half years before there's some tipping point coming, uh, before it's too late, and some governments have declared climate emergencies, but they haven't worked out what that means yet. Um, it's very despairing looking at the situation at that level. Um, it seems to me that uh, the financial system drives everything and nobody's really in control of the financial system. And nobody really understands how it works. So nobody has a really good theory or any power to change it. So, um, yeah, well, I mean, I, have, I guess that's what we're trying to do. And, and, and people, can, people can visit the Open Credit Network. It's opencredit.network, and uh, you can sign your business up and register. And um, how, how can people keep up to speed with what you're up to? Well, I've got the Twitter account, Matt Slats, M-A-T-S-L-A-T-S. -A -A I'm sure it'll be in the notes. I uh, keep a blog, uh, just writing once a month or something like that. Um, yeah, that's all. I'll link I'm, not, I'm not as uh, vocal as I used to be. Oh, I well. had 10 years full-time work, but I'm um, slowing down and living life a bit more. Well, we're trying to make you more vocal, so. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much, Matthew. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure.